everyone. I have to stand right next to our, our speaker this evening because uh, we're being taped for LA TV and um, she's got the mic. So I'm standing right next to Mrs. Adams. While I have um, an audience, am I going to get paid for this? There you go. <laughs> Royalties. See, you, you know, anyways. But I'd like to welcome you all to the Lemonster Public Library for our first um, pro uh, evening program for the fall season. I'd like to welcome everyone. Um, in the back of the room, we do have our flyer about the summer, uh, the Sunday, uh, Sunday programs that we will have coming up for our season. We've got a great lineup of programs, so you can pick one up on the way out. Um, and also, before we begin, I'd like to invite anyone who's not already signed up for our email distribution list. There are pink forms, in, again, in the back of the room. You can leave your email with me, and I'll add your name to the distribution list so you can find out about all the programs here at the library. Okay, so on to tonight's program. I'd like to welcome again B. Adams. I think many of you had the, uh, had the pleasure to see her when she spoke last spring. She just enthralled us for hours, it seemed like, talking about her, her life in Germany, and uh, we ran out of time. So we had to have her come back. So here she is, and I want to thank you for taking time. You're to entirely come. welcome, and there thank you. Go. you. So turn thank it you over all. to you. Here right you on. Uh, if you can't hear me, just speak up. I, I can uh, increase the volume. I'm going to talk here. Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you for coming. I'm overwhelmed at the interest of this story that I have. It's it's a simple story, the story of a child that grew up in a very special place during the, during the World War II. Uh, how many of you were at the first, um, okay, oh, all right. So, uh, in, uh, on the chance that I might bore you to death, I have to recap a little then for all the people that did not participate in the first uh, lecture. I'm not going to go into detail because we would be here till 10 o'clock. But um, it's difficult to find the starting point. The reason this is the little township that uh, we moved, my family moved from Munich to this little town. And the town itself is down here. This gray thing is the fog that comes out of a lake back in here. This is a beautiful spot. It's been a recreation area for, for years and years and years. It was founded in 1200 by monks. And they established a monastery there, and the town just grew around it. What really was advantageous for the town is huge salt deposits. That's why everything is called salt in that area. Salz means, is the German word for salt. Uh, Salzburg is a town in Austria very close. Salzberg is a lower, Ober Salzberg means upper salt mountain. And um, now I come to the point why we even moved. Okay, let me show you something. That man, was the love of my life until I met my husband. <laughs> my dad was an elevator engineer. And uh, after the First World War, the situation in Germany was desperate, utterly desperate. Money was worthless. Jobs were not available. I think I read one time the job uh, unemployment rate was something like 20, 25 um, percent. Germany had to pay enormous amount of monies to, uh, for the peace effort because they lost the war. They lost certain parts of the country to uh, abutting countries. Uh, Germany was down and out. My dad was, um, and, and what was scary was different parties uh, became active, especially the uh, Communist Party. And um, street fights. Uh, my family lived outside of Munich very close, and um, he was without work for three years. He had two children. My sister was six years older than I am, and I was a baby in 1932, and um, no, no way to earn a living. 
he used to go out in the fields, in the outlying fields uh, during the summer and dig up potatoes so we would have something to eat. Hitler, you all know the story about Adolf Hitler. He was an Austrian. He fought in the First World War. He had to get permission by the Bavarian government to fight in the war. Uh, he came back. He considered himself an artist. He thought he could become a painter. He didn't have any luck in his home country in Vienna, so he came to Munich um, 24, 1925. And, and during this turmoil in the country, these parties all came up, and they all had ideas how to improve the situation. Does that remind you of something? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, there was a party that <coughs> found its grassroots in, in Munich, the National Socialist Labor Party, National Socialistische Arbeiterpartei, okay? Now we abbreviate it to, we call them Nazis, but that expression was not known at the time, not even until the war was over. Anyway, Hitler became active. He, be, he turned out to be a, an excellent speaker and um, uh, then he had the bright idea to overthrow the Bavarian government, the 9th of November, and uh, he was ratted out. The police were waiting for him. They were, some of them died, nine of them died, and they were considered heroes all during the war. And there was even a song we had to sing um, of one of the guys that was killed. Anyway, uh, if I'm rambling, just let me know. Um, uh, he, um, he was convicted, he had to serve time in a prison, and while he was a member of the party, he met a man, uh, that Dietrich Eckhart, that had a house in Berchtesgaden, in that little town. Well, Hitler went to prison, but in, on the 24th of July, and was released in December because it was an, an amnesty for all political prisoners. When he got out of prison, he didn't know where to go. Literally, he didn't know where to go. His parents were dead, he had a sister, um, but it was not an option that he moved there. And Dietrich Eckhart told him, okay, you can, he had started a book, Mein Kampf, My Struggle, okay? Uh, I've read the book. It, it was fantasy, and um, it, it's not a, a literary giant. Anyway, he was doing, he wanted to finish his book, and it, Dietrich Eckert said, I have a house, you can use my house, you can finish your book. So he moved into this little township, and because this township was bordered on one side of Switzerland and the other of Austria, being Austrian, he felt very close to the landscape, and he moved there. Things progressed, as you well know, he became chancellor in 1934, and uh, the president of the German government, um, um, Hindenburg, died in 35, and Hitler being chancellor abolished the presidency and said, we put it in abeyance, I'm in charge, all right? Uh, laws were changed immediately. This is, brings up another issue. I have people ask me, if this happened today, could it happen again? If the circumstances were such as they were in those days, trust me, it would work again. If you give people hope and you just show that it is potentially possible, people will support you, follow you, regardless of what the restrictions are that you have to go under because this hope is stronger. After you've been through a time like the German people had gone through, you grasp at straws. Anyway, what they did, however, and it started right at the beginning, they abolished certain rights that the people had, rights to assemble. They abolished all the other competing parties. They were unlawful. Uh, uh, the right to private property was no longer there. 
freedom of speech, no way. Okay, you watch your mouth. Uh, you, we all know what the ramifications were when uh, people didn't follow the rules, okay? And at that time, he had already started uh, the industry, the heavy industry. He started building homes for the people. He had a great deal of sympathy for the common laborer. He, he built apartments with in-house bathrooms, before, there used to be a bathroom on a hallway, five, six parties living on a hallway, one bathroom. He said, the working man gets dirty, he needs his own bathroom. That was wonderful news for half or more than the people that lived in Germany. Anyway, this is how it got going, all right? And once the mill started turning, all of a sudden the German people found themselves in a position that they didn't know how to extricate themselves. Besides propaganda, the German people during the war didn't, didn't know what was really going on. They, on the newsreel, on the radio, they were fed what they thought they should know and no more, okay? Also, uh, people became suspicious of their neighbors. They didn't talk freely amongst themselves anymore. When I was a child, I never heard my pa parents talk politics because Beatrice had a big mouth. She would repeat anything she heard, you know, in school or somewhere else too. But that was the, that was the atmosphere that was going on in Germany during the, during the war. Now I'm going to come to the point why we moved from Munich, where my dad, oh, now, in 1933, one of my father's buddies said, there's a new party on the National Socialist Party. Why don't you join? You're going to get work. My dad said, what do you want me to do with a party? I'm not a party person. He says, I don't care. You've got a family. Think of your family. Join the party. Good enough, dad joined, I don't know how long, five months later he had a job. And he had a fabulous job. He was told to build a broadcasting tower in Berlin and that thing is still standing, although uh, Berlin was bombed practically right down to the ground. Anyway, after that was done, he had a job in Munich um, at a um, wholesale place for, um, farm goods, okay? Uh, anything for Munich was collected in this distribution center and there were huge um, warehouses that were uh, cooled and he was in charge of that and there were elevators all through there. It, it, it was a good job. Well, when Hitler became chancellor, like any good leader, he surrounded himself with people that thought like he did and uh, uh, agreed with him because he was a great talker. Hitler had odd, odd uh, habits. He would stay up half the night and then sleep till 11 o'clock in the morning and then uh, go for a long walk if he when he was in Berchtesgaden at his house. And then he would orate all evening and he had all these people that couldn't get away from him, his adjutants and all the people that he invited to live with him while he was in this little town, and they had to stay up with him and listen to all this. So um, you had people that took advantage of this. And there was one guy, his name was Martin Bormann. He was secretary, and when, um, when what was the name of the guy that defected to uh, Scotland? Hess, Rudolf Hess was second in command. Rudolf Hess was blinded by goodwill and uh, removed himself and Martin Bormann had a very good way to sneak into the spot because Martin Bormann always knew what Hitler wanted. And sometimes he knew what he wanted before Hitler even thought about what he wanted. And Hitler was going to turn 50 years old on the 20th of April, 1939. And Martin Bormann said, let's give him a monumental birthday present. And that is, you see the topography of this 
country here, okay? It's all mountains. This is a canyon, sort of like. Let me run through some of these pictures, then you can follow me better, okay? Already. If I can make, okay. See, can you see some of these mountain roads? It just goes up, 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 and up, and up. And on top of here is this mountain called the Kehlstein, the Kehlstone, okay? There's a plateau up there, no bigger than this, the footprint of this room. And he said, let's build a tea house up there because Hitler had, Hitler had the habit of always going for tea in the afternoon. He had several in the area where he lived. And, but let's make this very special, okay? You can imagine how special it is. Uh, there's no other way to go up there but a very defined road built by uh, Italian road makers. They're the best road makers in Europe, at least I've been told. And uh, because the access to the house itself, the, the rock formation was so narrow, there was no room for a road where a car could get up there and no place to put a car. So they decided to build a tunnel, dig a tunnel into the mountain, 500 feet in, huge thing, taller than this, this room. And at the end was a large rotunda and an elevator. And the elevator would go up 500 feet and come out in the center of this tea house. Let me show you. That's Martin the Borman, this stout man here. You see, he was always behind Hitler. Absolutely like he could read his mind. Anyway, I will come back to all this. There is the tea house. Can you see it? It's like a pimple on a rock. <laughs> when we were bombed on the 25th of April, 1945, they couldn't hit it because they didn't see it. It blended in with the rocks. Okay, now, see, now it's even more. Oh, uh, where's my little thing? Right up here. And there's a, a road that goes up there, wide enough for one car, and that's the house. Okay, so they needed somebody that would be able to oversee the construction of this elevator. And they found my dad, and, <clears throat> and they sent him there in 1938 to put this thing together. And we moved, my, my family, my mother, my sister, and myself in 1939 to a little enclave that uh, sort of grew out of the fact that, that Hitler had his house uh, in this area. They needed personnel for uh, drivers for the convoy that Hitler used to come. They needed troops to protect the area. Uh, in other words, they needed housing for the personnel. So we had an apartment given to us where we lived. Now I'm going to back up. Now Hitler, when he moved to this garden and finished his book. His book was a big seller, so he made money. His sister had bought this farm. This was an inn and a farm at the same time. Not uh, agricultural, it was a, a, a milk farm because there is no land flat enough that you can grow any kind of a crop. So anyway, she bought the house and when Hitler uh, received all these royalties for his book, he bought the house from his sister. All right, now by 1939, um, Hitler had established himself as a miracle maker. He uh, got Germany going, as I told you, because he started armament and he had buddies like Krupp and, and Farber and uh, um, he had great ideas. Um, he, Volkswagen came into being a Hitler. A, a Germany was on the way up. Germany was improving itself. He started building the Autobahn. We all know about the Autobahn, right? And uh, his followers, the group around him said, this is a humble home. You've got to do something about it. These people would come in droves, stand on these 
roads and wait till he came out so they could see this man that was hauling them out of the depth of despair. So they said, no, you got to do something better. So they tore part of it down and put this up, okay? The side building still the same. This was a very famous, a very famous uh, window. Um, this was the dining room, um, a terrace right here, okay. And up there somewhere, way up there is the tea house. Anyway, um, my mother was a city woman, a city girl. She, uh, this was pretty rural. There was no school there in this little gated community. There was no, no grocery store till maybe three years after we moved there. There were just a, a handful of houses and a, a SS barracks. And when I say barracks, it had nothing to do with the barrack. It was a, 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 a quadrant of beautiful um, two-story buildings, cement with stucco on it. The, anybody that been in Europe, you know what the way they build houses. It had nothing to do with what we call a barrack. Anyway. There was nothing to do up there. We had a, a movie theater, big, huge place, a big hall. They had to put something up to entertain all the workers that were up there because this community was in the making, okay? They were, the, a hotel was established, big, beautiful hotel, a uh, couple of stores, uh, souvenir shops, a post office. But that wasn't overwhelming. The movie theater was for the laborers that built all these buildings, okay? And it was free, and there was a show on Saturday in the afternoon and every night in the week in the evening, and it was free. You could go in. If you could stand the fact of sitting on a hard uh, bench for two hours without a backrest, but it was entertaining and it was free, but my mother was bored stiff. I was a kid, I was seven years old. There was no school up there, so all the people that lived up there, and there was, of course, Martin Bormann had a house because he didn't move an inch away from Hitler's back. I don't want to say backside, but <laughs> you get the drift. Uh, so. Martin Bormann was a prolific man. He had nine children, all right? So he requisitioned a house that used to be a uh, convalescent home for children with asthma. Beautiful, big building uh, in the Bavarian style. Anybody that ever seen the Bavarians, it's partly uh, uh, concrete with stucco front and the upper floor is all wood with large balconies overhanging windows, beautiful house. Okay, next one that built a home up there was Hermann Göring. Well, Hermann Göring, he had several homes everywhere, but he liked to be close to where Adolf was, so he built a house there. I'll show you a picture of it. No, this is what Hitler's house looked like after we were bombed. Okay, and I'll tell you about that after. Okay, this is the location. Hitler's house was down here. Bormann's house was here. He had a view that he could just look down the mountain and see what was going on in Hitler's house. Uh, Göring's place was over here. This was the SS barracks. Right now, all these woods grew up over the course of 50 years. Looked totally different in those days. All right, so okay. Göring had a little girl, but she was too small to go to school, but Bormann had nine children, and five of them were school age. Um, then there was a, a place at the foot end of, of Göring's house, about here, that was called the adjutancy. And when things got hairy in Germany and bombing rates were more frequent than ever, Josef Goebbels, the minister for propaganda, he had four children. He had a son. His wife was Mary Pryor. She had a son by his first, first marriage, but he was not in the picture. He was already in his 20s. He had a boy, and he had three girls. And they, all their children started with the letter H, so they wouldn't confuse them. 
I guess. Anyway, those little kids went to school with me. Okay, we got in a bus every morning, met at a place, got on the bus, and we went to school and diversed into our separate uh, classes. Uh, people ask me today, was it, was it odd? We didn't give this a thought. It didn't matter who they were. It, it didn't, when you're 17, seven years old, you're not impressed by this sort of thing, okay? And uh, as I said before, some of the Borman children were very well aware of their stature in, in the community. Um, the oldest boy, Martin, uh, he was going to military school. I think he was 12, 13 years old, and he was full of it. And because we we're such a small group of kids, we go, would go to each other's houses. What, what do you do in the afternoon after you did your schoolwork? The Bormans had a room downstairs in their house that we called the, the, the raving room because you could do absolutely anything in there and it was permitted. You could yell, scream, they had ladders on the wall, you could do anything you wanted. It was a wonderful place to play. <laughs> But, it, you know, Mrs. Borman was, when she wasn't pregnant, she uh, rested a lot. And she would say, go somewhere else, go somewhere else. They would come to our house. My mother, as I said, my mother was, um, my dad was forever instilling in her to be careful what she said. Because it was um, not easy for her to keep her mouth shut about certain things, obviously. And uh, one day, uh, the oldest girl and Martin were at my house. And Martin Borman wanted something to eat. And it was wartime, and mother said, I can give you oatmeal, OK? Be because we were already on rationing, and it, there was just nothing there. And uh, he, we have an expression in German, and I'm not going to say it, because I'm a lady of quality. OK? <laughs> but it has something to do with your posterior and what you could do if you, if you f were so inclined. OK? So he told my mother to do that. And she says, Martin, you will leave this house right now. OK? And uh, he went home and he told his mother what my mother just said. And she said, don't ever come back. I don't want to see you in here anymore. And uh, my mother was shaking in her shoes because she figured, OK, now I'm up for being deported. Because that's, we, will you please believe me that we did not know about concentration camps? But there were prisons that you ended up in, like Dachau. I explained to somebody, Dachau is an old prison in Germany on the outskirts of Munich. It was there in 1850, OK? like conquered down here. Would you think for a minute that somebody is gassing people in conquered? It was just not in the concept of people's understanding how, how this sort of cruel thing could take place, okay? We were, we were told, okay? We were told to be the, the land of the thinkers and the doers, okay? We were the Aryan race, we were the, cream of the crop and the top of the mountain and all these fine things. But would you think that any of those would stoop to the point and exterminate somebody? We all woke up after the war, didn't we? Anyway, I'm taking too much time, folks. So anyway, mother was unhappy living in this little community. It was gated. You could only have uh, visitors if they were related, closely related. Brothers, sisters, uncle, aunts, mother, father, that sort of thing. Uh, so she, uh, my father was busy maintaining that elevator up there because of the uh, uh, physical location of it. It was exposed, of course, to all sorts of weather. So there was a continuous uh, repair job going on. Besides, the elevator was inside the mountain, and it had the influence of, of a cave on this machinery. What they did uh, to make sure that there was electricity up for to run that elevator, they had uh, put a huge basin of <coughs> machine oil in the ground, and they put a submarine diesel in it. 
for an auxiliary power source. And uh, that all needed taken care of, and my dad was busy with that, and uh, the war had started already, and, and, but he was not drafted because Hitler, uh, he needed to be there if Hitler wanted to go up into the eagle's nest. The funny part, no, oh, well, the Americans called it the eagle's nest. We called it the tea house. <laughs> the funny part, the funny part was, Hitler went up there exactly five times because he didn't like heights. <laughs> and I think the five times wasn't so very much uh, voluntary either. Okay, one time Eva Brown's sister married up there. That was one of the times that he went up there. Anyway, whenever Hitler decided to go up there, my dad had to be up there running that elevator. Okay, he was in the cabin. I'm gonna, it's on the end of, the, of my roll, but I will show you all these pictures anyway. But um, although I was young, uh, it, it bothered me that every time dad had to go up there, he said formally said goodbye to us all, my mother, my sister, and myself. He would literally tell us, he would call me over and say, you be a good girl and you listen to your mother, as if he was going away and never going to come back, okay? Should have told me something. It just bothered me that he, he said all this, but it, I never gave it a thought that there might be a reason why he's doing that. My sister was seven years older. She had an idea. Um, getting back to uh, Goebbels and his children, all starting with H, and I'm going to show it to you. OK. This picture was taken from Martin Spormann's house after the bombing. And that's Hitler's house right there. Oh, totally destroyed, of course. This building was an inn that was used for the uh, uh, Secret Service because they also had to keep eyes on what's going on at Hitler's house. Okay. All right, there's the man himself. And he surrounded himself with children. He was the, the kind uncle. Okay. I'd point out all the children that are Borman kids. That's Martin. That's the one that told my mother. <laughs> okay, that's his, his next sister. After that, her name was Ilse. And when um, Hess defected to uh, Scotland, Ilse's uh, godmother was Hess's wife, and her name was Ilse. Okay, Hess defected, and he was persona non grata, so this girl could no longer carry the name of Ilse. So she, they rebaptized her Heike. It was, it was not easy to keep them apart, okay? She wouldn't listen to Ilse anymore. Anyway, this was some of the idiosyncrasies. Okay, that's, oops, no, sorry, back up. This girl is Irmgard. I went to school with her. That is a Bormann boy, that's a Bormann boy, Bormann girl, Bormann girl, and Bormann baby, okay? Albert Speer, mean anything to you? Minister of Armament. At the time he joined the party, he was an architect, and he designed a lot of the buildings in Berlin and all that. That's his children. That boy here, that boy here, that little girl there. I don't know who these twins are, and that's Sepp Dietrich, that's the man that gave him a place to live, Sepp Dietrich, Dietrich's boy, okay? All right, that's uh, Bormann Helga, and that's Borm, no, that's uh, Goebbels Helga and Goebbels Hilde, and that sweet little thing was me in those days. <laughs> that was, we were going to school, we were just buddies, we were just friends, okay? There again, I mean, I'm place of honor in the middle, long braids, can't see them too well. Hilde and Helga, we were just really good friends. And uh, little Helmut had a birthday. And um, we were all invited, handful of kids, and little Helmut ate, we had, we had whipped cream and God knows what else, and that was maybe 1943, when most of the people in Germany had no clue anymore what whipped cream was. 
And uh, next day, little Hamer couldn't go to school because he had eaten too much whipped cream. <laughs> and um, of course, what did B do? She come home after school and she says, Mother, what do you think? Hamer didn't go to school today. He, he got so sick on eating whipped cream, he couldn't go to school. My mother was on the way to the grocery store and she had to walk and it was a good long walk, good half hour. And she mauled that over all the way to the store. And when she got to the store and the people standing in line for their goods, she opened her mouth. She said, yeah, yeah, we here we stand waiting for the meager rations that they were allotted to. And Helmut Goebbels ate so much whipped cream, he couldn't go to school because he was sick. All right, she bought her groceries and she went home. Now, this will show you how the apparatus worked communication system. Phone rang, it was my dad on the phone. My mother's name was Maria and he called her Mitzi. Mitzi, what did you say? She said, what did I say? You were at the store, what did you say? Oh, you mean the thing about Helmut? He said, listen, you have to be more careful. You don't want to say things that will end you up in a place where you don't belong. And besides, we, your kids and myself might be implicated too, okay? Well, from now on, I'm, I know she was more careful, but that didn't alter her spirits. She was just sick and tired of that whole episode of living in this closed unit where everybody watched each other and you couldn't trust anybody. So she started aggravating. She started aggravating my father. And when a woman starts to aggravate, <laughs> there isn't very much that a man can hold up against, okay? So she said, I want out of here. I want our own home. I, you, I know this is your livelihood. We are very comfortable, but I want out of this gated community. I want to be a free person, have the friends that I we have come and visit. So in 1943, another area was developed. A uh, building was strictly on the code. You couldn't decide that, that what kind of a house you wanted. There was a series of houses available. You said, yeah, this is, I wouldn't mind this. So, okay, you, they built this place and you moved in. All right, she was out of the area. But by that time in 1943 already, Bombing had started in Europe, okay? And the way the mountains were, let's see what the next one is. Okay. Uh, the mountains, you saw the mountains, how high they were. And they would bomb by day and they would bomb by night. And in a certain direction, if you looked over one mountain, you could visualize Munich there, 200 miles up the road. Well, in, at night, the sky would turn crimson because the city was burning, okay? Incendiary bombs, sometimes this. Munich was destroyed 80%. And she would stand at her kitchen window and she said, my city is dying, my city is dying. And as a kid with nine years old, your heart is bleeding and you say, why, you know, how are we gonna get out of this situation? Uh, my sister was engaged to a man, he was a pilot. He was by, his profession was a school teacher. He was a language teacher at the university in Munich. And, uh, and when they drafted him, he always had a, a flair for flying. He became a pilot and he flew the dive bombers. Well, as you know, the war in Russia was already taking place and uh, the massive, uh, France was defeated, and uh, nobody was bombing uh, Holland and, and uh, Denmark and Norway, so all the air raids were going <coughs> east into Russia. He was shot down five times. And because he spoke Russian, he would always get help getting to the German front because the people in Russia thought the Germans would liberate them. They were in the same situations as the Germans. Stalin was no choir boy, 
okay? <laughs> so especially the Ukraine, they had nothing to do with a man from Georgia that was a brutal dictator. So they helped my sister's um, fiance to get back to the Germans and he get back in another plane and fly another mission, get shot down again, and he always made it. But one day in Munich where he lived, it was an air raid. And he came out of, he was on home leave and he came out of the cellar because he was, uh, a, he was a fanatical flyer. And he said, he had told us when he would visit, he says, my sympathies are as much with a guy that's flying the other plane for the other nation. Because I know what it is like if you get shot at and you get, you get shot down. He was watching the skies and a house collapsed on him. So that was the end of Carl. He was a lovely man. Anyway, why am I telling you this? That's the situation it was. Uh, there was another situation in Germany. There was, we were told we were, my father was Lutheran, my mother was Catholic, we were all baptized Catholics. We were told that the division of the uh, religious sects is unhealthy. We should all learn to believe in God. That's it, okay? Don't call yourself this, that, and the other. Just believe in God. We don't even need a church. You, it's, the goodness is in your heart. And what it, you, you know what, what is required of you to be a good person. My mother was very unhappy. And my dad said, hey, Mitzi, don't worry. Nobody can read your mind. Okay, what is in your heart and in your mind it doesn't matter. It's just something that we have to live through, okay? So, of course, there were babies born up there because it was a growing community. There were marriages taking place with uh, government officials doing all the, uh, the ceremonies. And to make it a little festive, you heard of the Hitler Youth, yes? That was mandatory. Pope um, uh, Ra Ra what is his name? Ratzenberger? No. Yes, something like that. Anyway, he was in the Hitler Youth. They tried to make an issue of it. He couldn't. It, it was a normal thing. If you were six or seven years old, you became part of the Hitler Youth. If you were a girl or a boy, okay. So we had these little groups. The boy did this Boy Scout thing, and the girls had had, had little gymnastic uh, sessions, and we we sat together and learned songs and all that. It was very benign. It was it was actually pretty good because it kept the kids together, gave them something to do. But if there was an occasion, like for instance a baptismal or a wedding. They recruited us girls, and we would sing our little songs, and uh, the government official did its thing, and afterwards there was usually a small party, and us girls were invited, and we got cake and whatever else there was, and when, when we were about nine, eight, nine, ten years old, we started spying on the women who was pregnant and how far advanced and when could we expect another little party. <laughs> it, it, the place was isolated. We had to make our own fun, right? Anyway, things, my dad was not drafted because he could not leave, so they had to give him a job. They get, gave my dad a motorcycle with a sidecar. I don't think, let me explain this, this portly man. Anybody know who he is? Yes, and that's his wife, Emma. She used to be an actress, and that, that adorable child in the front's name was Edda. And aren't they just so proud of what they had created? My dad had a, a special memory to the date that this child was born. And every birthday, he sent her a little bouquet of mountain flowers. And this thing, if I could show you on the back said from Emma, Mr. dear Mr. Mayor, thank you for the lovely flowers. Uh, uh, Edda enjoyed it very much. And you know what else she said on the bottom? Not sincerely or friendly or what? Heil Hitler. 
It's pathetic. I hate to say it, folks, it's pathetic. Think about it for a minute. We have an election every four years, and potentially we have an, a chance to have every four years a new president. How would you feel if every four years you had to retrain yourself and say, hi, hi Bush, hi Clinton, hi uh, Hail, Hail, okay, it came from the Latin word Hail Caesar, hi uh, Obama, okay? People were so indoctrinated. The Bavarians used to say, good morning, uh, guten tag, uh, grüß Gott, that means greet God, or guten Abend, uh-uh. Heil Hitler, okay? This is it. You got talked to in the street. If you, somebody observed you saying, good morning, good morning, Mrs. Smith, don't you know the German greeting? Heil. Hitler, okay, after the war was over. That was the hardest thing to get rid of. <laughs> I mean, Hitler was gone, but we were still hailing the man because we've been doing it for six or eight years. Or as long as I lived, I never said anything else but I Hitler. That, that was difficult, but anyway, we got over it then we. Anyway, that's the reason I have this picture. This is the house that Bormann had up there, okay? Uh, this just one, see the mountains in the back? Isn't it lovely? Uh, uh, it, it's modest, it's a modest home. I have a shot of the, that's what it looked like after it was bombed. Okay, with all the building going on and the war progressing, uh, they realized the, the authorities on the, up on the hill that this little community needs protection. Made no sense to build anything above ground, so they drilled into the mountains, okay? And all the men were fighting already, so the only workforce they could find was from people whose countries they had invaded. And in 1943 and 44, there were Italians working on places like that, where, where we moved after we got out of this little gated community, uh, we could see them. They had a labor camp. Um, I must say, there was, there was no, it was not a labor camp that you say the people suffered greatly. They suffered, okay? They had very little to eat, and they came with the clothes that they were rounded up in. But um, we could... We could see, we saw Polish people, we saw um, French, Italians, uh, Norwegians from all districts that had been occupied by Germany. They collected a workforce. And my mother, the one, the one uh, ration coupon we had plenty of was bread. The bread was nothing to write home about. We, 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 we were convinced there was 60% sawdust, mm. but it was bread and we had some to eat. My mother would, would give the, the bread coupons to some of the men that she saw working, going to work. There was one guy I shall never forget. It was maybe November and he had tennis whites on, okay? white slacks and a white shirt and he was cold and he had newspaper in here and coming out the back because he had nothing else. This sort of thing, I mean, you would have to be brain dead to see that this wasn't right. This, this was abnormal. This was not something that you wanted to see, okay, because it bothered you afterwards, especially my, my family, okay, but you don't talk about it because Beatrice couldn't keep her mouth shut. Anyway, let me show you some more. All right, now my point was this. These, these people that all came from other countries, they had no loyalty to Germany. And if there was an opportunity to do spying, and this was a perfect place, they would do so. And there were ways to get the information to the Allies. When we were bombed on the 
25th of April, 1945. The bombing was strategic. Every place of importance was destroyed. Now the bomb fell down in a little village because they knew it had nothing to do with what was going on up on the hill, okay? We were considered persona non grata anyway from the people down in the village, okay? Some of them profited from what was going on at Hitler's place and others desperately resented it, okay? which came out after the war was over, okay? So how did the uh, English bombers, Lancaster bombers, know where Hitler's house was, Bormann's house? It was sabotage, it was, it was, the information was there. Okay, let me show you. Bormann, I told you about him. That's Bormann's second boy after after the war was over, all these nine children were dispersed amongst uh, people. Uh, Mrs. Borman died shortly after, the, after April. Um, they ended up mostly with farmers. There's Hitler again, and that sweet little person there on the side. Anybody know who she is? Eva Brown. Eva Brown. My mother used to say very after the war because then she didn't have to be afraid anymore. She said, if stupidity would, wor would hurt, she'd be screaming all the time. <laughs> she, was a, she was a very simple, sweet little person. She had, every time we saw her, she had another fur coat on, different fur coats. She had a couple of little dogs, sky terriers like this, and she was very friendly. She was lonely up there too, having to sit up till two and three in the morning listening to Hitler's diatribe. Anyway, that was Eva, and I don't know who the children are, somebody's uh, relative. That is, that house is, was another uh, a, um, sanitarium, a, a building that was constructed to house uh, convalescent patients. And Albert Speer, was uh, an animal of a different color. He really had very little to do with a close circle around Hitler. And he removed himself, him, himself and his family physically from that uh, gated community. This was way outside the gated community, okay? He appropriated this house and uh, when Okay, now I'm, I'm, I'm cutting it short because I want you to know what happened after. Um, the, my, my sister's fiance, used to, the, the bomber pilot, used to say, you don't have to worry being bombed where you are living. It's too confining. The, the canyon is too tight. They can't get in here. They, they don't worry, they, they bombing the big cities, that, that's understandable. But what could they gain by bombing this little place and all that? So we were blissfully ignorant, okay? My mother would say, you know what, I don't feel so good about it. We should put some of the stuff in the cellar. And my dad said, what, and live with empty rooms and all that? No way, we don't have to worry, anyway. Uh, on, we, we would, as I told you, we would take the bus down to school. And uh, the uh, bombing raids came on a very predictable time. That is the flyovers, okay? Um, 9.30, 10 o'clock, the sirens would go off. We kids took our pieces of paper and whatever else and um, um, went down to the bus station, waited for the next bus to go home because school was over for the day. A school only lasted till 12 o'clock anyway, okay? And uh, of course, when a uh, school system in Germany is, is different, you go to grade school until the, uh, the, uh, the form four, and then you have the chance to go to a higher education, what they call a lyceum or, or um, gymnasium. And uh, pass a test and go on like you call high school now, and that would be eight years. Uh, if you were not so inclined or 
wanted to learn a trade. You continued on grade school until you, the eighth grade, then you got out and you joined a, um, a, a school like Monty Tech, okay, to further your education in that direction. Well, when you started high school after the fourth grade, you started with Latin, English, math, um, chemistry, physics. It, was, it wasn't easy. It was, you had to get your mind around that sort of thing. And uh, at that time, I wasn't really that great in physics. And um, when it became physics class was maybe 11 o'clock, and it, it turned 10 o'clock and say, well, they today I didn't do my homework. <laughs> and sure enough, 10 minutes later, the sirens would go off and say, dismissed, OK? It was, it was, it was not a hardship. <laughs> anyway, because we got to go home early, and nothing happened, OK? On the 25th of April, 1945, it was a spring day, sunny spring day. The alarm went off. And because these children that I showed you, the Goebbels children and the Bormann children, were all in the gymnasium in a, in a higher educational uh, institution, uh, they rounded us up. They must have been six of us. And instead of going to the bus stop, there was a car waiting for us outside the school. And they herded us in, and the thing took off and took us up onto the mountain. Now, every place, every one of these houses of these dignitaries had a bunker, underground bunker. You walked down the flight of stairs, and you were in an underground bunker. Maybe I have a picture of that. Oh, this, was, this is um, Albert Speer, OK? Uh, there was a, he had an office down below his house that he built. OK, all right. This is a typical entrance to one of the bunkers. Can you make that out, what it is? It's not a very good picture. It's cement with a light fixture and, and a, a handrail, but it went definitely down, OK? Uh, they didn't let us go home. They deposited us in the SS barracks uh, in a courtyard and say, go into the bunker right there. There was personnel there. There was a kindergarten there, so they had a sizable bunker for these kids. And the Borman children had a connection between that bunker and theirs, so they all went in. Well, when we, are, when we were in the courtyard, we could see the planes going over, OK? And we were just lots of people there, women, children, uh, the men were, there were hardly any men up there anyway, uh, drivers for Hitler's convoy, that's about all. Um, so we were predominantly women, and with that, the first bomb hit. Well, I n didn't know it at the time, but it, I later found out what they dropped on this little place up there were blockbusters. And they could make a hole in the ground that you could put this building into it and cover it over. And the, the concussion of that hit was so strong that it knocked everybody that was on the stairs clear down, all right? It, you, you just fell. Cement stairs, uh, you, you were hurt, your elbows, your knees, you yelling, screaming. I cannot explain what bedlam was going on. OK, not only that, those little light fixtures, they didn't just go out, they burst. So shards of glass everywhere, it was horrendous. But they kept moving us further, moving us further, picked us up, go in, go in, hurry up, and you could feel the bombs dropping, OK? So we made our way into this long tunnel, and there were benches on both sides, and we waited, and we sat, and. Uh, and um, uh, you, you could feel it was still going on, scared out of your wits, nobody to talk to, nobody, they were all in the same boat. Uh, after about maybe two hours, it subsided, and then somebody said, we should really send somebody up to see what was going on. And there were a couple of 
people, a couple of uh, soldiers there, because there was a division of SS men there, okay? They didn't move a muscle. The boys got up, the 10 and 12 years old. They hustled up there and they said, it, it looks so different. It is, it's all so different. And with that, it started all over again, okay? Another two hours, maybe. I think it was over maybe 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And um, we were still sitting there. Didn't have a clue what to do. And um, I heard my dad's voice, and he was calling me. He was out in the field with his motorcycle and his sidecar. I loved that motorcycle. I didn't ride in the sidecar. That was childish. I sat on the wheel of the, that there was a, a, a fender, and I sat on the fender, and I was, I was cool. <laughs> so that motorcycle, BMW machine, 750 cubic centimeters, I know everything about it. <laughs> he was out, and he was lifted up and slammed down, and that motorcycle kept running whenever he could find even ground. So he called me and he found me and he said, Let, let's, let's go home. He says, there's nothing left. The house is gone, but your mother and your sister are all right. So I came out of the bunker and I, if, if it hadn't been for the mountains to orientate yourself, you would not have known where you were. No trees left, uh, the, all the buildings gone, smoke coming out of this, dust everywhere and the sun was shining, and the mountains were still there. So we made our way over to our house, and there was one wall was standing. My mother never went into the bunkers, never, never. She said, yeah, we've been told we we're never gonna get hit. So, and my sister worked for a construction company that built these tunnels, okay? She usually stayed also in the office during the, uh, air raids because she had work to do. That particular day she was going to do payroll and one of the guys took the adding machine. So she followed the adding machine into the bunker. That's what saved her life. And my mother, after the first wave, she got religion. She <laughs> took her little bag. First she threw all our bedding down two flights of stairs, from upstairs to the ground floor and then into the cellar. And then she took her little bag and went into the bunker. And that's what saved her life. All, all just fate. And uh, all right, that particular night, what do we stay? What do we do? We, uh, the, the air raid alarm started up again by about 6 o'clock. My mother, my mother, I remember her. She was out in the yard. And she had a stick and she was going through the rubble, looking for cutlery for her teaspoons. And she kept saying to herself, I shall never save again. I shall never save again. And she was true to her word. She would, if she wanted a good time, she had a good time. She never, she uh -oh. never went without something she really wanted to put money away, because she says it's senseless. If something comes, you lose it anyway was a good policy after that. She lived to be 80 and had a good life. <laughs> anyway, so we went back into the, into the bunker because there was an air raid and one of the men that uh, used to come to our house and do our jobs, he was Hungarian, he was a huge guy. He was like a sumo wrestler. He thought my sister was cute and, and, and got kind of friendly and my dad disappeared for her. I mean, he came back with a machine gun. <laughs> I had no idea he knew where to get one and how to handle it, but he figured he needed a big weapon to get rid of this man. <laughs> anyway, next day, what do you do? What do you do? You stand there like these people that have been affected by the tornado. You got, you got a bunch of sticks. Uh, we had bricks all over the place. Uh, we could we extracted some of the, our clothing, and Dad said my friend down in the valley he had a uh, sawmill. He had a very large house. He said he told me I could, we could move in. So we literally just took what we could carry, 
no bus, I mean, picture, the roads were impassable, okay? My dad's motorcycle still worked, but not all the roads were passable. So uh, we made our way down there and with whatever we could carry, and uh, we found refuge in that house. That was 26th, 27th of April. My dad's birthday was the 27th of April. It went by like any other day. My dad was, was always absent, okay? He knew we were safe. We had a roof over our head. But he disappeared with his motorcycle. What he did was requisition gasoline. Wherever he had an opportunity to fill a gas can, he saved it for his motorcycle, OK? In the meantime, he was scared stiff what was going to happen now because of his position where he worked in his close proximity to Hitler, OK? He, he realized that he was in a very precarious spot here, so he kept moving, okay, he kept moving. Um, the 5th of May, we were still living there, it was, it was small, confined, but I mean, I can just imagine the depression that my mother was going through, okay? There was no school. Everything stopped, okay? Uh, I don't know what happened in town. Of course, nothing, no, no bombing took place, okay? Because we were so isolated away from that place. But we were in limbo. And on the 5th of May, uh, the road was very close to the main highway from Austria to Berchtesgaden. We heard rumbling, serious rumbling. And everybody came outside and looked, and there was tanks coming along the highway. OK. American uh, tanks had a star painted on the side, a white star. And we associated the star with the Russians. OK. All during the war, we were indoctrinated. Every day, every opportunity was found. Don't ever think you're going to survive at the war if we lose. It's over, OK? If you don't win the war for the German people and our leader, Adolf, you don't deserve to survive. That was it. <coughs> don't, don't even give it a thought. We've got a secret weapon, 1944. It's, it's going to save the war. Don't worry. But if, if it doesn't work, don't think you're going to have one opportunity to live after that. OK, it's pretty, pretty heady stuff for a 12-year-old to say, what's going to come next? And how am I going to die? OK? And we knew for sure if the Russians were going to come, we're going to die very soon, OK, all of us, because we were deathly afraid of the Russians. All right, so we thought, this is the end. The Russians are here. What are we going to do now? Clutching each other. And it's so comical. And one of the tanks had a black man sitting up there, OK, in full battle fatigue outfit and with a gun like that. But he was black. We said, hey, wait a minute. The Russians don't have Negroes in their troops. It's got to be the Americans. The Americans came. We have a chance, we have a chance, we have a chance, okay? That was about the feeling when we saw all these troops coming. It wasn't all roses, it wasn't, it, somebody once said, there are a lot of good men in every war, but definitely all the bad, okay? Night times, you hear girls scream, jumping out of windows, OK? I personally saw a GI, and he had a tie on. And he had wedding rings lined up on the tie from, from the bottom with a knot on the bottom till the top. I am convinced these people didn't say, you want my wedding ring, OK? I was surprised that there wasn't a finger attached to it. But that was just my point of view. All right. Then 
life goes on, what you do for, for food. Because we lived up on that hill, we were considered the elite for the poor people down in the valley, which had a pretty decent life, but we thought we were, we were special, we had special privileges, this, that, and the other. So we were not really very popular, and if we were even known in the village. The village was a closed community, okay? They didn't know you. Um, you had very little chance to get what you needed, okay? Uh, my dad was on the road. Okay, now I must tell you about the eagle's nest. Now I'm going to go on here. This is the eagle's nest I told you. Here's a bus right down here on the bottom. See this? See the bus? That's the only way to get up there. This is not a private road. It's now owned by the uh, uh, German uh, Alpine Club. Okay, the Bavarian government took over from the Americans when the Americans more or less left the area. But it's the German Alpine Club and it's a money maker, ladies and gentlemen. They make in, take in two, three million visitors a year. Unbelievable, everybody wants to go up there. Here's one of the roads, here's the house. Okay, here's the elevator. First of all, this is a parking area, right? Mm -hmm. This is the tunnel that takes you in right here, huge thing. You drive a car in there, and in the rotunda you can turn the car around, and then you enter the elevator. That's the elevator. Looks, they thought it was gold when they first saw it. It's, it's brass, of course, okay? But can you imagine what that thing would weigh if it was gold? I mean, nothing could lift this up 500 feet into the top. Okay, when, when uh, we, after the bombing, the first troops that came to Berchtesgaden were mercenaries. They were de Gaulle mercenaries. They were French Foreign Legion. We had a severe winter. This whole area here was covered with snow, even in April. They it would slide down, totally covered. They had no idea that there was a tunnel or even an elevator. And prior to that, they were in the ruins of Hitler's house and they found the liquor supply. And there was plenty of that, okay? And they got all liquored up and they drove up as far as they could drive. And then they saw this house up there and they scrambled up into the mountain, up the mountain road. And uh, uh, the elevator doors, if the cabin was on the bottom, the doors on top wouldn't open. So they saw this, these doors and they say, oh, now we found Hitler's hiding place, okay? Out in the open were cement sacks because the, the place is made out of granite and it had to be continuously repaired. So there were large amount of, of uh, cement sacks. So they shot the door open to the elevator and they saw all these strands, these wires, these cables that were holding the elevator and the cabin was down below. So they took the, the cement sacks and threw them down there. Okay, 500 feet, not many survived whole. So the whole business of support for the elevator was coated in cement. Big clumps all over the place. The elevator was not usable, okay? The Americans came, the uh, uh, High Commissioner for, for Germany came, and of course by that time, this was all melted away and they wanted to use uh, the elevator. And it, it didn't work. So, uh, the word got around that there was a man that lived in this area that constructed this thing and knew what to do with it. And Dad was cruising around with his supply of gasoline trying to evade the army because he thought he would be arrested immediately. They just wanted him to fix that elevator. <laughs> so he said there was a, a very nice Captain Snyder that came and moved into the area up on the Ober Salzburg, and he, he was Jewish. The man had a soul. The guy was, um, he was a mensch. 
if you know what I mean. The troops were stationed in that hotel, okay? People had very little to eat, like I just explained to you, although it was springtime, and uh, I'll tell you later to what extent we took advantage of what was growing. Um, uh, he, he, the, the mess hall was always had leftovers, okay? He permitted the children to come with a container and take what was left, okay? I am convinced that many a kid didn't have some kind of disability because he had a decent, one decent meal a day, even if it was just pancake batter, you know, or God knows what else was left. He distributed it to the children. He didn't ask, what's your name? Were you a Nazi? Was your dad a Nazi? It was a child, and he did something for the children. Overwhelming. The guy that came after him, a year and a half later, he put gasoline on the stuff. He didn't. He, nobody should have this. These people are animals. Did you see what they did in Dachau, in Birkenau, in Bergen-Belsen? These people are animals. They're not supposed to survive. Okay? Attitude. What are you going to do? All right? You survive. You survive. You see? I survived. Anyway. Uh, they finally found my dad, and Captain Schneider said to him, can you fix this? He says, yes, but I need a place for my family to live. Because his good friend that had taken us in suddenly had a change of heart and figured we were a liability and he wanted us out of there. So Captain Schneider said, well, there got to be some kind of a place that is still standing. And my dad said, yes, the former home of Albert Speer is intact. Okay, he said, move in, move in. He said, I have no furniture. He said, well, see what you can find, for goodness sake, but get this elevator going, okay? <clears throat> so he rounded up a crew of his old buddies. Emma Göring had a, a, a chauffeur by the name of Kurt, and he had friends, and they painstakingly chipped away at all these wires and, and cables and all. I don't know how long it took them, but they got the elevator going. Okay, let's see what else I got. This is the tunnel entrance. Now it's, as I said, these are all tourists. That's the tunnel, and it was all, it's all granite, it's, it, it, but it's the atmospherically uh, uh, impacted, you know, because the, the, the rocks are weeping all the time inside. That's the lamps on top. I don't know, you can't see this. This is the elevator door. That she took a picture. Uh, see the reflection? Um, people in back, and this is funny. No, let me show you this one. This is the ceiling, and you see the heads of the people standing below. She's, she's a cook. Anyway, all right, this used to be uh, the, the, the tea house only had three rooms. No, five. A huge round building that was the tea room with a, with a fireplace, uh, which I will show you. Then there was a dining room adjacent between the kitchen and that large tea room. When we were bombed, uh, we had to leave everything, okay? The farmers in the surrounding farms would come and see what was left and take it away, okay? These people had such a good life, they can do without this. And uh, going to a grocery store, like I told you, my mother was down to about 90 pounds. She, she couldn't walk the distance because it was over an hour to get to the village. So I was... Um, designed to, uh, I had young legs. Did you ever hear that expression? You, you can stand up for two hours, you got young legs. Anyway, I used to go to the store and stand in line and when it came for me to be uh, waited on, they didn't know who I was. So I'm sorry we're out of this and we're out of that. And no, sorry, no, no meat, no sugar. You can have bread, we have bread. That's, that's what faced everybody. We had money, of course we had money, but it didn't buy anything. 
for instance, I was, and now I, there was no more bus to go to school and we were living up on the hill. I had to, used to have to go to work, uh, go to school, walk, okay? Winter was easy. I had a sled. You know the sleds with the high runners? And they had a little uh, a sled uh, trail that was built just for that. It was easy, but then you had to hoof it back up in, a, in after school. And I, I, when I had studying to do, I used to study walking because I already knew my feet had to be at a certain angle because the grade was like that. So I just walked and walked and read my book and all of that. It worked, it was great. Um, I had, I was, in 1945, I turned 13 and I didn't have any winter shoes. I didn't have, well, I outgrew my shoes, okay? Do you think there was any place Anywhere I could have found a pair of shoes, my dad, my family. My dad had a spare pair of yellow boots. And this is, this will go to the grave with me. For two years, I wore those yellow boots, all right? Girlish uh, um, desire to look stylish was just not in the picture. I had those big clunky boots and at least my feet were protected from the pavement. That's how situations were. People became hostile towards each other, not, not joined together like after an, an incident like we have found here with so many tornadoes and hurricanes. No, they, they started hoarding things for themselves, okay? Um, like I told you, the, the stealing part in the cities. There were no men left after the war. They either died or they were in prison camps, okay? All we had was old folks and young boys, 12. He even Hitler even recruited those, if you ever seen the movies. He, 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 they call it the Volkssturm, the people's uh, uh, defense, okay? Uh, the women, Thank goodness the summer came because it made it easier. So if it would have been winter, many more would have died. The women would sit in the cities by the side of a huge pile of bricks of, of what was left of a building and clean them with a hammer and pile them up next to them. Their kids playing around them, okay? And they would get paid according to how many bricks they cleaned and they got ration cards, so it was a necessity. So the, we had a word for them, Trümmerfrauen, that meant uh, rubble women. These rubble women were responsible for putting the cities back together. You do what you have to, okay? And then, as I told you, what did you say, Charlie? They got the plan that came over. Oh, yes. Yes, the saving grace, folks, was the Marshall Plan. In the beginning, we got stuff we didn't know what to do with. Powdered milk and powdered eggs, and oh, what do you do with that? Uh, but you figured it out. It was, it was springtime. Uh, when we moved into this house, um, where Albert Speer was, the water system had been interrupted. And uh, the water was contaminated, and we all uh, had typhoid, okay? Debilitating. Besides, what we were eating didn't help either because the apples started coming on the trees and they were about this big. It was fruit and we gathered that and we uh, made applesauce out of and that exacerbated the, the condition that we were in. But uh, <laughs> nobody had to worry about their weight, okay? <laughs> uh, the, as I told you, my mother turned, was 90 pounds and uh, there was no school for us for um, almost a year until the sh regime got going again, okay? Um, it, but we survived, we survived, we survived. We would go to the farmer and, uh, uh, with a container and we were allotted milk, a certain amount of milk, if he had it or if he felt like giving it to you, okay? So you lived literally from day to day. Um, 
the, um, the American soldiers were all over the place because it was such a famous uh, location. Ever so often, there was a, a little driveway up there, a jeep would drive up, and I was uh, elected to be the greeter because I was the only one that spoke English. And I had a sister that was seven years older, and she was not hard to look at. <laughs> so there was all sorts of jeeps kept coming up that little road, okay? And one time, I remember it was Mother's Day, and it must have been in 46 or 47, I think it was 46. And this house, this, this house had balconies, okay? And we were standing on the balcony and my, there was people, neighboring people had come and I was on the balcony and I was imitating Hitler. And I said, Volksgenossen und Volksgenossen and on and on. And with that, the door behind us opened and there's a, a, a I don't know what rank, but he was an American soldier. We thought, okay, firing squad, this is it, okay? We just, she just found out we were old Nazis, okay? But it, it was all very harmless, and, and my dad uh, had organized from some place a box of dried, uh, uh, cubes of dried soup, okay? Like this. They were like this, and it made about six cups of soup. There were two flavors. There was vegetable and peas, pea soup. We lived that all summer. We survived. We survived. You do what you can, and there were others in the same boat. The place was, when we moved in, there was a, a, a Mrs. Uh, Speer had a room for herself, a beautiful boudoir, and the floor was covered with photographs this deep. I, I'm not exaggerating, this deep. All personal photographs, some of them of Hitler and, and whatever is going on. All right, the place had a furnace. We burned them because we were scared stiff. If they found these pictures with us, they thought we were affiliated with this. Stupid, can you imagine the money we threw away? Life magazine would have paid a fortune for that stuff. <laughs> anyway. Uh, what should I tell you? We survived. We did all we could. Um, my dad, in 1947, there was something going on called denazification. And it was instituted by the German people, German government. Let's eradicate all these, these Nazis. <laughs> they, they were. Have you ever seen old war footage where? They are hailing Hitler when he comes, drives through with his, with his touring cars. He's standing up front and greeting, and they're yelling and screaming and, and, and waving flags. That was all a mirage. They were always against him, okay? Every German was really against the system. Down, they just didn't say anything because they knew it wasn't safe. That's the attitude that's a killer because you can't, you want sympathy in certain situations. You want empathy. You want somebody to say, I know what it feels like. I'm going through the same thing. So the German government was rounding up all people that were early members of the party. And my dad, 1933, okay, he was not the first and not the hundreds, but he was an early member. And besides, my dad having that motorcycle, he had a raincoat. The SS had a rubberized raincoat with a, and, and, and a cappy, you know, a little uh, 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 cap with a bill in the front. Because he was always in the open, on an open motorcycle, he had one of those coats and he had one of those hats. They said he was with the SS. You know what was the prerequisite to be an SS? You had to be six feet tall. My dad was Five foot eight at the most, okay? Besides, he, he, he was just not with the SS. He was somebody that built an elevator and was forced. Well, I must say this, my dad was pro-Hitler, 100%, because he said he got me a job. He got me out of the hole I was in. I owe something, okay? And after the war was over, there's many, many, many people that said in Germany, 
if Hitler could come back, he'd clean up this mess, all right? I mean, it's ludicrous mm -hmm. if you considered what Hitler did. But anyway, denazification, they found my dad guilty, and they trundled him off to prison in Bomberg, okay? Um, his good friend Kurt, the uh, chauffeur for Emma Goering, um, he and, and my dad had an agreement. My dad had all that, the room that I told you up in a tea house had wood paneling. And my dad had put all the plans for the elevator behind one of the plan, uh, panelings. He could take it off, he put it all in there, put the plan, panel back. Okay, after a, 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 a reasonable time in the clink, uh, Kurt sabotaged the elevator. <laughs> thing didn't run anymore. Couldn't get it going. Nobody knew what was ailing the thing, okay? And uh, I don't know, um, I think, I don't know who was meant to come. I think it was Chief Justice Warren was meant to come up to the eagle's nest because that was the thing to go to Bertis Garden for. And this elevator isn't running. All right, uh, and then Kurt said, well, you know, the man that built this thing is still alive. Oh, good, where is he? He's in Bomberg in prison. What, is he criminal? No, no, he's a political prisoner. Well, get him over here. <laughs> All right, so they, they sent for him and um, Two weeks later, he was back, and he miraculously fixed that elevator. <laughs> and uh, my dad was employed by the American Army the minute that uh, Captain Snyder had found him. So he was working for those, uh, for the American government, okay? And he stayed on that job until he was turned over to the, to the Germans. And then we got tired of living up on that hill, and we found an apartment down in the, in the valley. Uh, I'm, life went on. I went to school. I graduated from high school. Um, and then one fateful night, I met a, a young man in, in, at a bus stop. And I was, I was working for a, a officer's hotel in this in this lovely community. And um, uh, I was at the desk and I met all these lovely captains and majors and lieutenant colonels and colonels and they all were infilled. They, they convinced me that uh, a GI is not the guy to go out with. GIs are poor diplomats. They tell you they have a house and a job in the United States and they are just leading you on. It's the, it's the officers you should go out with. Well, little bitty town where everybody knows you, you, you couldn't afford to do that. It was, it was suicide. Everybody knew everybody else. They knew my dad and my dad was like a spotted dog in that, in that community. He had a lot of friends. Uh, so I, I had nothing to do with the officers, okay? And then there was this lowly corporal, and he was standing at the bus stop, and I, was, I thought I had missed the bus. And in, in my desperation, I overcame my dislike for the uniform, and I said to him, has the bus been? No, he says, I'm waiting too. So we stood there, nice side by side, waiting till the bus came, got on, Charlie sat in back of me, and then he says, after a, a dutiful period of silence, wanna go bowling? <laughs> <laughs> and that was the beginning of the end. <laughs> the thing was, it, it wasn't easy because he was not aware, allowed to wear civilian clothes. So he was always in uniform, and, <coughs> and, and whoever saw me, my dad was told, how do you permit this? that your daughter goes out with the enemy, okay? He said, he's not the enemy anymore. He was drafted like everybody else. He didn't fight in the war, he's just over here, you know, protecting us from the Russians who were bound to come in sooner or later through, through uh, Fürth, which was the direct line into Eastern Germany. Anyway, uh, as you 
no, my reason for being here is because we got married. I had to be denazificated too. I had to show that I was, I was a member of the Hitler Youth, but that was all my affiliation with, with the Nazi uh, party and all that. It, is, um, it has changed over there. Many have been here probably have been over there. The Germans got themselves out of a hole because they are, and I must please believe me, they still believe in hard work, and if you, only you can fix it, okay? Nobody else is gonna do it for you. You have to get down like these women with their little hammers and have, have to fix it. The present youth in Germany has got it made. They, they ask us dinosaurs because when I die out, nobody can tell the story because nobody lived through it. They say, why didn't you fight? Why didn't you protest against all that? Ha! Huh. Talk to people in Iraq, talk to people in Libya, in, in Syria. They try, okay? Only the Germans were much more disciplined in eradicating people, right? How, how, how far do you think any kind of a, a protest would have gone? Wouldn't have worked. Besides, all the men were fighting all over the world. It was pathetic. And what for? Will you tell me what for? It didn't, it didn't improve anything because the improvements came afterwards. So thank you, thank you. Let me show you the rest of the pictures. This is, the, this is a fireplace that Mussolini uh, gave, uh, uh, donated when this place was built. This is the round uh, um, uh, tea room. This is a colonnade, my dad's name somewhere in there on the outside, and Mrs. Borman, always being in the state of, of blessed, um, uh, <laughs> help me out. <laughs> she was convinced that the high altitude was good for the child she was carrying. So she had um, um, a lawn chair out here, okay? You see the windows up there? Yeah, okay. She had a lawn chair up there, and in order to have the maximum effect on that, this uh, developing child, she undid her clothing, and she just laid there. And the time would, uh, she, had, she couldn't come alone up there. She had a convoy of, of, of soldiers, okay? They drove her up there, and they were guarding this place, and ever so often they'd look down, oh yeah, she's still there. When is she going home? God, it's getting five, you know. My wife has got supper ready, and she's still out there. It was hilarious. Didn't do them any good. The kids weren't any smarter than any of that. Okay, this is a room that's naughty pine. Yeah, it was pretty. That's the back end. That is going up towards the other back end of the, of the uh, building, up towards the mountain, and there's mountain goats up there. One, le one quick little story. We were starving, and uh, one of the soldiers had shot a mountain goat. And it was at the time of the year where uh, there was hoar frost in the grass, and the, the mountain goat must have eaten something that swelled its, its belly up. So the soldier thought this was a pregnant female, and he wanted nothing to do with it. And he said to my dad, do you want this thing? It was before Christmas. And my dad said, I'll give it some thought, okay? <laughs> and he dragged this thing home and dismembered it, and uh, we ate mountain goat. We ate it fried, stewed, boiled, uh, 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 slivered. At, at the end, we couldn't look at another piece of meat. It was, but it was food. It was food. Anyway, and there were uh, uh, ravens up there. My dad would put them something out to cool, and the ravens would come and, and, and peck at it. It was a gorgeous place. I used to go up there and bring him supplies, walk. It wasn't easy. Uh, but, uh, you know, he couldn't leave. So somebody had to supply him with food. That's the valley. That's Austria over there, right over here. So you know, when Hitler looked out, he looked into his homeland. I'm sure that had a reason why he picked this place. Okay, some more of the scenery, lots of mountains. 
My, this is what our daughter took pictures. That's down in the village. Look at the little, tiny little village. And this is the remnants of the community where we lived when I told you we were permitted to build our own house. It was all destroyed, but they built it up. All cluster zoning. You know, no, you can't put a house here, a house there. It's always cluster zoning. <coughs> Mountains and, and uh, again, very steep mountains. She just apparently liked the scenery and there's some more of the same. And this is when you were up in the tea house. On a cloudy day down below, it looked like this. The house was in the, in the, in the clear. And that, that's what fascinated me the most. And with that, folks, I wish you good night. Any questions? You're so patient. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Want to know how I met Hitler? Okay. On his birthday, 1944, he, Hitler had, a, uh, had Parkinson's, and his left hand had an extreme tremor. So he kept his hand behind his back all the time. He came up, this was his last visit to his house in, up on the hill. And they gathered us little people together, and uh, we stood at one of the checkpoints and waited for the convoy. In April, he used to come in these huge Mercedes touring cars. He was in the first, first car, and uh, he had to stop because they opened the gates into his terrain. And they told us girls to wish him happy birthday. And for some reason, because I was so cute, they gave me a bouquet and told me to say happy birthday. And I, I, I and you know, you didn't say happy birthday to you. You just, I said uh, something like, my best wishes, mein Führer, my leader. And he, and he shook my hand. Well, it was the biggest disappointment of my life because this man had the fishiest handshake. <laughs> and I went home to my mother and said, Mother, he shook my hand. And it was like nothing. She says, please don't say anything. Don't talk about it. Just, just don't ever mention it again, OK? That was my moment of glory. Yes, my mother came visit, to visit seven times. She loved America. She was, uh, she, she did propaganda over there for America. Everything was better in America. People were friendlier. The, the roads were better. Uh, they said, uh, um, it's just, they said, have a nice day. That, that really overwhelmed her, OK? Uh, oh, my mother learned English off the television, OK? And I was working for Crocker Burbank at the time. We had no children. And I would come home, and there was a program called Queen for a Day. Anybody remember that? And she would meet me at the door, and the tears were running down her face. And I said, what's up, mother? What's up? I thought something happened. She said, this poor woman, all she wanted was a refrigerator. Said, Thank you for being so patient. <laughs>